welcome. We begin the news with Anaru Kumara sworn in as Sri Lanka's president. Rescuers search muddy riverbanks after floods killed six in Japan. Trump says he won't run again if he loses U.S. election. Zelensky visits U.S. to present peace plan to Biden, Harris and Trump, and Singapore prepares for largest corruption trial in decades. Stay with me for these more stories. Beginning of the election, Mazis lean polit politician Anura Kumara Dasanakaike has taken his oath as Sri Lanka's latest president after he was declared the winner of Saturday's poll. Early Monday morning, Kumara took his oath at the Presidential Secretariat building in Colombo. He said he understood the complexity of the problems facing Sri Lanka and will work hard to realize people's hopes and win the confidence of all Sri Lankans. According to the Election Commission of Sri Lanka, the 55-year-old leader of the People's Liberation Front, JVP Party, and the National People's Power, NPP Alliance, won the presidency with 42.31% of the vote. Disanayake ran for office on a pledge to address corruption and clean up politics in the South Asian island nation. The election was the first since mass protest forced Gotabaya Rajapaksa from office amid an economic collapse in 2022. The situation has now stabilized with the backing of the International Monetary Fund IMF for the stern austerity measures brought extreme hardship to several people and voters punished Rani Wakramansa, who became president after Rajapaksa fled at the ballot box. The JVP led two rebellions in the 1970s and 1980s that killed over 80,000 people before it renounced violence. The Sayaki was a JVP student leader during the second insurrection and has described how one of his teachers sheltered him to save him from the government backed death squads that killed party activists. The party remained a peripheral player in the Sri Lankan politics and won less than 4% of the vote during the last parliamentary polls in 2020. The Sanayake counts Mazi's revolutionary Chi Guevara among his heroes. Since his rise to popularity, he has softened some policies, saying he believes in an open economy and is not totally opposed to privatization. On climate crisis, in central Japan, rescuers have searched the debris stream banks of a river searching for victims after homes were swept away in flooding and landslides that killed no less than six people. Heavy rains took the Noto Peninsula and Peninsula, rather, an area still reeling from a devastating earthquake in January over the weekend, transforming the Skukada River into a muddy torrent that flooded roads and a remote hamlet. After the skies finally cleared, police and firefighters from across Japan were joined by residents and the father of a 14-year-old girl who is one of seven people still missing or whose status remains unknown. From Saturday, rain pounded the region with over 450 540 millimeters recorded in the city of Wajima over 72 hours, the heaviest continuous rain since comparative data became available. The flooding hits the area as it makes a fragile recovery from a magnitude 7.5 quake on New Year's Day, which fell buildings, stoked tsunami waves, and triggered a major wildfire. The flood waters inundated emergency housing sheltering people who had lost their homes in January 1st earthquake which killed at least 374 people. On Monday afternoon, 3,700 households still had no power, according to the Hokiruku Electric Power Company. Over 100 hectares, areas rather, in the area were isolated with roadblocks due to landslides. Now on U.S. 2024 election, Republican election contender Donald Trump has said he will not run again for the presidency of the United States if he loses the November 5th election. When asked if he saw himself running again for four years time if he is beaten by Democratic rival Kamala Harris, the 78-year-old former president said, according to report, no, I don't. The property tycoon added that he hoped he will be successful at the ballot box. Polls suggest Trump and Harris, who became the Democrats' candidates after eight one-year-old incumbent Joe Biden withdrew in July, are neck and neck in the major battleground states likely to be decisive in determining the winner. In 2020, Trump lost to Biden but refused to accept the defeat, claiming the election was stolen and sparking conspiracy theories. On January 6, 2021, fervent Trump supporters stormed the U.S. Capitol in an effort to stop the certification of the result. 
the Republican who was president from 2016 to 2020, faces criminal charges over efforts to overturn the election results. He denies any wrongdoing and has cast the indictment as politically motivated. He has refused numerous times in recent months to commit to unconditionally recognizing the results of November's election. If he were to attempt a fourth campaign for the White House in 2028, Trump will be 82 by then. Meanwhile, Volodymyr Zelensky, Ukrainian president, has commenced a high-stakes visit to the United States during which he will present Kiev's plan to end the over two-year-and-a-half-old war against invading Russian forces to US President Joe Biden, as well as election rivals Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. Zelensky, who will also attend the annual meeting of the United Nations on Tuesday and Wednesday, urged Ukraine's allies to assist him achieve a shared victory for a truly just peace. On Thursday, he is anticipated to present his peace proposals, which he has dubbed a victory plan to Biden, before later meeting Harris, who is vice president, his office has said he's, uh, he expects to meet Republican candidate Trump on Thursday or Friday, although no date has been officially declared. The Ukrainian president is in the U.S. after a summer of intense fighting with Moscow, advancing in eastern Ukraine and Kiev, occupying tracts of Russia's Kursk region. Zelensky made an unannounced stop or under extraordinarily tight security at Pennsylvania Venetian's plant, which manufactures 155mm artillery shells. The shells are significant to Ukraine's war effort and it has already received over 3 million of them from the United States. No details on Ukraine's newest peace proposals have been made public yet, but Zelensky said Biden will be the first foreign leader to see the plan in full and that it will then also be presented to all leaders of our partner countries. He has said that the entire plan will be ready by early November. The proposals, he said according to reports on Friday, emphasize quick and concrete steps by our strategic partners. One of those steps, he said, was related to strengthening Ukraine's weapons capabilities, while another demanded a clear place for Ukraine in the war security architecture. The 155mm shells made in the Scranton plant are used in Howitzer systems, which are bigger guns with long barrels that can hit targets up to 15 miles to 20 miles. Zelensky has also been pushing the U.S. and other allies to permit it to use Western-supplied long-range weapons to strike military targets deep inside Russia. Biden has so far resisted, with Moscow claiming such authorization will be akin to NATO countries being at war with Russia. Zelensky's visit also coincides with U.S. preparations for a fresh $375 million U.S. dollars military aid package for Ukraine. According to reports, two U.S. officials last week said the package will include patrol boats, additional ammunition for high-mobility artillery rocket systems to Mars, as well as 155mm and 105mm artillery ammunition. Singapore, a nation constantly ranked as among the least corrupt in the world, is preparing for that sporadic of things, a high-profile corruption trial. S. Iswaran, a former transport minister best known for his role in assisting to bring the Formula 1 F1 night race to Singapore, is the first political office holder in almost four decades to face a corruption probe. On Tuesday, September 24th, the 62-year-old goes on trial on 35 charges of obtaining valuables as a public servant, corruption and obstructing the course of justice. Civil servants and political office holders are prohibited from accepting gifts valued above 50 Singapore dollars, that's 38 US dollars, in the course of their duties. The father of three is accused of accepting over 400,000 Singapore dollars, that's 306,000 US dollars, in gifts from two businessmen, Malaysian billionaire Om Ben Seng, who was also instrumental in securing the F1 race, and Lum Kong Seng, a man with strong ties to grassroots organization in Iswaran's former electoral ward. The gifts include tickets to West End Musical, flights, bottles of whiskey, English Premier League match tickets, and even a Brompton bicycle. Neither Ong nor Lum have been charged with any offence. I reject the charges. I'm innocent, is Warren wrote in a letter to then Prime Minister Lee Hien, Sol, Lee Hien Lung on January 17th, the day before he was charged. He later added through his lawyers that he did not know did not know the gifts from the two men he regarded as close friends could be considered veiled gratification. 
He stepped down from office and quit the long ruling People's Action Party PAP in January, shortly before he was formally charged. Lee said in a statement at the time, the government has dealt with this case rigorously in accordance with the law and will continue to do so. I am determined to uphold the integrity of the party and the government and our reputation for honesty and incorruptibility. Singaporeans expect no less. According to report, most of the tragedies Swaran is facing come under a rarely used provision of the penal code that has been part of the city-state criminal legislation since 1871. The provision makes it an offence for a public servant to accept or obtain anything of value for free or for inadequate payments from any person with whom they are involved in an official capacity. Swaran's legal team is led by ex-PAP lawmaker Davinder Singh, a senior counsel who has often represented Lee as well as his late father, Lee Kyung Yu. Among the 56 prosecution witnesses is Iswaran's wife. The first part of the trial will continue until September 27th. A more story is now United Nations General Assembly proves plan to tackle global threats. The United Nations General Assembly has approved a blueprint to bring the world's progressively divided nations together to address 21st century challenges. Those range from climate change and artificial intelligence to rising conflicts and growing inequality and poverty. The 42-page Pact for the Future challenges leaders of the 193 United Nations member nations to turn pledges into real actions that make a difference to the lives of the world's over 8 billion people. The deal was adopted at the opening of the two-day summit of the future called by United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres. He said the group was assembled to, as he put it, bring multilateralism back from the brink. It includes 56 actions on issues including eradicating poverty, mitigating climate change, achieving gender equality, promoting peace and protecting civilians, and reinvigorating the multilateral system to seize the opportunities of today and tomorrow. Secretary General Guterres singled out a number of major provisions in the Pact of the Future and two accompanying annexes, a global digital compact and declaration on future generations. The Pact commits world leaders to reform the 15-member Security Council to make it more reflective of today's world and redress the historical injustice against Africa, which has no permanent seat, and to address the underrepresentation of the Asia-Pacific region and Latin America. It also represents the first agreed multilateral support for nuclear dismemberment in more than a decade, Guterres said, and it commits to steps to prevent an arms race in outer space and to govern the use of lethal autonomous weapons. The United Nations chief said the Global Digital Compact includes the first truly universal agreement on the international governance of artificial intelligence, AI. The compact commits leaders to form an independent international scientific panel in the United Nations to promote scientific understanding of AI and its risks and opportunities. It also commits the UN to in initiate a global dialogue on AI governance with all major players. The pact's actions also include measures to mount an immediate and coordinated response to complex shocks, including pandemics, Guterres said, and it includes a groundbreaking commitment by governments to listen to young people and include them in decision making. As of human rights, Guterres said, in the face of a surge in misogyny, a rollback of women's reproductive rights, governments have explicitly committed to removing the legal, social and economic barriers that prevent women and girls from fulfilling their potential in every sphere. In African scenes now, aircraft displays while visitors at South Africa's aerospace show on Saturday, hundreds of aviation enthusiasts braved the cold weather to watch a display of various aircraft and see exhibitions sh showcasing some of the newest aviation and drone technologies at the Africa Aerospace and Defense Trade and Exhibition 2024. The yearly air show, amongst the biggest aviation displays in the world, took place at the Waterloo Air Base in the capital Pretoria this weekend. The show drew aviation experts, companies and enthusiasts from across the world with the South African Air Force leading in displaying its aircraft and allowing pilots to showcase their skills. Cheryl Wadzel, an aviation enthusiast, was proud of South Africa's contribution, describing it as top class and it's really worthwhile. His son, Dua Wadzel, also an enthusiast, was ecstatic by the opportunity to get close to the aircraft 
Unlike seeing them in the air, a sporadic opportunity for most and different from video game simulations. Siri Ramposa, South Africa president, was among visitors to the show this week. We take a quick break now and when we come back I'll bring you stories from Nigeria. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. Stories from Nigeria, and we begin with political matters. INEC declares APC's Opekwolo winner of Edo governorship poll. After months of extreme politicking in Edo State, the Independent National Electoral Commission INEC has declared Monday Opekwolo of the All Progressives Congress APC as the winner of the intensely contested Saturday 21st, 2024 governorship election in the South South States. Okwe Bolo 54, Ghana 291, 667 votes defeat Asu Igodalo of the People's Democratic Party PDP, who secured 247,274, and Olumide Akpata of the Labour Party LP, who came a distant third in the race with 22,761 votes. 14 other candidates contested the seat but got less than three frontline candidates. At exactly 9.27 p.m. local time, INEC's returning officer for the poll, Professor Faru Puta, said that Okweholo, Monday of APC having satisfied the requirement of the law, is hereby declared the winner and is returned elected to delightfully cheers from APC supporters at the Collision Center in Benin City, the state capital, on Sunday. Puta, the vice chancellor of the Federal University of Technology, MENA, in Niger State, declared the winner of the poll after a series of recesses. The APC candidate declared over 10 of the 18 local government areas, leaving the PDP candidate with marginal victory in the other local councils. The APC gained control in two of the three battleground senatorial districts in the state. The Edo Central Senator, Okwekbolu, leveraged major influence in his senatorial district and joined forces with his colleague in the National Assembly from Edo North, Adams Oshomole, to defeat Igor Dalo, the anointed candidate of the outgoing governor. His victory could also be attributed to his alliance, Dennis Idahosa, his running mate, who is a federal lawmaker, and Obasaki's entry deputy, Philip Shaivu. The declaration on Sunday evening brings Okwekbolu closer to achieving his aim of becoming governor of the state and places his party, the APC, on the cusp of a return to power at the Dennis Osadebe government house. In 2020, the APC lost power in the state after the incumbent Godwin Obaseki defected from the party to the PDP in the heat of an intra-party squabble and fallout with his predecessor Oshomole. After he was denied the APC governorship ticket, Obaseki joined the PDP and clinched the ticket to defeat APC's Osagi Izeyamu to seal his second term, which will end on November 12, 2024. Obaseki campaigned strongly for Igodalo, while Oshomole was a focal figure for Opegbolo's campaign, attending rallies and interviews on behalf of the APC candidates. And finally, on the news on climate crisis and flood, federal government warns Nigerians to clear canals, drainage and gutters. The federal government has urged Nigerians to clear their canals, drainages and gutters to mitigate floods. A dam update report by the Nigeria Hydrological Services Agency, NISA, on Sunday said the water levels at the nation's critical stations along the river Benue indicated a steady rise towards flood levels. According to the statement signed by Head Media and Publicity, Loretta Samuel, as of Saturday, the rise continues but at flood preparedness level. Samuel urged the 12 flood prone states earlier won by NISA to put strategies in place to contain or allow conveyance. This is as a recent overflow in the Alau Dam triggered the worst flooding in Maiduguri Borno state and in the history of Nigeria. This is as Borno government has started fumigating as flood waters recede in Maiduguri. After Ram Bundi, the senior special advisor to Governor Babangana Zulum on me new media, revealed this while making a briefing at the Flood Disaster Situation Room in Maiduguri. According to reports, the governor's aide said the exercise was going on in earnest as displaced persons returned home. Bundi said the step was to contain the possibility of an outbreak linked to the devastating floods that affected sewage systems and other dangerous items. 
Meanwhile, the flood has continued to ravage farmlands and roads in the outskirts of Meduguri, leading to the cutting off of the Meduguri Mafadikwa Gumburu Road. According to more reports, Borno is an international trade gateway with federal roads linking Nigeria with neighboring countries of Cameroon and Chad. A recap of major stories says Anura Kamuru, sworn in as Sri Lanka's president, rescuers search muddy riverbanks after floods kill six in Japan. Trump says he will run again if he loses U.S. election. Zelensky visits U.S. to present peace plan to Biden, Harris and Trump and Singapore prepares for largest corruption trial in decades. Thanks for watching. That's all on the news. Have a blessed day.